Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for your word, for this church, and the way that you have certainly been faithful to your word to build this church, God, to establish this church. Even as we gather here for worship, to reflect on those most important truths uh, that you've given, given to us, uh, the gospel. God, I pray that as we turn our attention now to your word, that we would be encouraged by what you said so long ago, but what is so relevant to us today. Thank you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 13 to 18. The title of this sermon is, So We Went Together. Uh, I took this phrase from Frederick Douglass's autobiography, which uh, when it was written, it quickly became a very popular and useful slave narrative, uh, since it contributed so much to the abolitionist cause in the late 1800s. If you don't know, Frederick Douglass was a 19th century uh, self-educated former slave-turned-abolitionist who, once he gained his freedom, documented his life as a slave. And in his narrative, he recounts the time that he attempted to run away from his captors with four of his friends. It was 1835, and Frederick Douglass was probably about 18 years old. There was no way for him to be absolutely certain they didn't keep strict birth records for slaves back then. But he figured he was about 18 years old. He knew he was approaching manhood. And being that, by this time, he had taught himself how to read and actually read enough of the Bible and anti-slavery literature that he became uh, overwhelmed with this sense of freedom that he wanted what should have been rightfully his or what was rightfully his. And so he became so burdened by the thought of remaining a slave the rest of his life, he purposed that he was going to put an end to it and make an attempt at gaining his liberty. He told his friends if they didn't make an attempt at least once in their lifetime, they weren't worthy of being called men. And so Douglas conspires with his friends. He creates this elaborate plan for how they're going to make it all the way to the north and gain their freedom. He says this, I therefore resolve that 1835 should not pass without witnessing an attempt on my part to secure my liberty. But I was not willing to cherish this determination alone. My fellow slaves were dear to me. I was anxious to have them participate with me in this, my life-giving determination. And so from the very inception of this idea that he was going to gain his freedom, he was determined not to do it alone, but to actually include his friends on this. So over months and months of planning and rehearsing the plan, Douglas and these four friends who agreed to run away with him were, had formed a very special bond with one another, as I'm sure you can imagine. They grew extremely close in their friendship as they went over this plan and endured the hardships of the plan together. As the story goes, the, the day comes for them to finally make this escape. And they were planning to leave the night of this day, and unfortunately, another slave who had known about the plan actually alerted the slave masters. They were arrested and then interrogated separately to find out if what they were accused of was actually true. And they uniformly denied the allegations, and they decided that whatever happened to them, they would let it happen to them together. Again, Douglas writes this, we denied that we ever intended to run away. We did this more to bring out the evidence against us than from any hope of getting clear of being sold, for as I have said, we were ready for that. The fact was, we cared little where we went, so we went together. 
Our greatest concern was about separation. We dreaded that more than anything this side of death. See, you can hear his longing as he's writing and recalling these events to be with his friends come death or not. The separation is exactly what did end up happening, though. The, the people who owned them decided to separate Douglas from the other four men since they suspected that the whole idea was his anyway. And now, one more quote. Listen to how he describes what he felt when his friends were actually taken from him. He says this, I was now left to my fate. He's alone in a jail. I was all alone and, without the, and within the walls of a stone prison. But a few days before, and I was full of hope. I expected to have been safe in the land of freedom. But now, I was covered with gloom, sunken down to the utmost despair. Douglas and his friends were anticipating the same event together. Together, they were waiting and waiting and waiting to finally be liberated from slavery. It was together that they had been longing to enjoy the fresh fruit of freedom after having endured the brutality and hardships of slavery together. And when they were finally separated, Douglas was left alone, and this changed all of his hope into the utmost despair. There are some profound parallels between this account and Frederick Douglass' experience as a slave and what was actually happening in Thessalonica. In the Thessalonian church, when Paul wrote to them, there's something similar as what Frederick Douglass experienced that we just recounted. Let's look at our passage. We'll start at verse 13 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll see the details come forth. God says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What's happening in Thessalonica? Verse 13 says that they are uninformed about something. And that lack of information is causing them to grieve like people who don't have hope. The ignorance of the Thessalonian church is producing a hopeless grief among the people. So first off, what Paul is writing here is not a rebuke, and it's not even a correction of something wrong with their thinking. What we're about to unfold is additional instruction from the Apostle Paul for the Thessalonian church. It's additional instruction. And with the words ending chapter 4 and beginning chapter 5, Paul intends to put an end to the grief that's happening in the Thessalonian church. What exactly is the Thessalonian church ignorant about? What's the issue about which they need more information? Look again at verse 13. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about what? Those who are asleep. The Thessalonian church is ignorant about something having to do specifically with those who are asleep, that is, believers who have died. The passage is clearly all about this, about them, since they're mentioned in every verse except the, the section, or every verse in the section except verse 18. We've already seen it in verse 13. Paul calls them those who are asleep. In verse 14, 
those who have fallen asleep. In verse 15, again, those who have fallen asleep. In verse 16, they're called the dead in Christ. And finally, in verse 17, Paul says, we will be caught up together with them, a reference to the same group of deceased believers. So what's causing hopeless grief is they're being unaware of what happens to those believers who are, as he says, asleep. Remember that we just learned recently from Smed that the vocabulary of death gets a makeover for believers, right? It, the vocabulary of death takes on a new shape for Christians because our relationship to death is fundamentally altered because of our salvation. Death is no longer an end for us, something to be feared and avoided at all costs, but instead, death for us is really more like a nap. Death is what happens to believers, a break between life as it is now and life as it will be after we're resurrected. This is not to be confused with soul sleep, uh, what Jehovah's Witnesses teach as some sort of intermediary state where you're not really dead, but you kind of are, and you're really asleep, but only Jesus can wake you up, and no one else has the power because Jesus has special powers from God. This is not that. They're simply asleep in the sense that they are dead awaiting the resurrection. So the point of the passage is this. We have it up for you on the screen. Paul ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church by doing three things. He ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church first by revealing the resurrection priority. We see this in verses 14 to 16. Paul ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church first off by revealing the resurrection priority. And I'll tell you up front, this sermon is top heavy. So after about 40 minutes, when we're still in point one, don't, don't fret. He begins his instruction with something that they already know to be true in these verses, in verse 14. Something that none of them actually are ignorant of, which is Jesus' own death and resurrection. Look at verse 14. For since or if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will do something else. Bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Paul's point here is to say, listen... You guys believe the gospel. You're Christians. You know how Jesus died and then rose again? Okay, well, God's going to do something similar with believers. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, meaning God will cause deceased believers to join Christ in his resurrection. And if there was any question about how Paul knew this or on what authority he could speak with such certainty about a future event that he had not experienced yet, he states the very next thing he says in verse 15 was, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, a word from the Lord. This is Paul's way of saying or assuring the Thessalonian believers that his knowledge, his awareness of this future event is not his own intuition. It's not a feeling that he has. But this comes with the stamp of approval, the certainty of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ himself. It is a word from him, something that was directly revealed to Paul by the Lord himself. In verses 15 and 16, this is Paul detailing the resurrection priority. And what does it say? Again, verse 15. Look at it in your Bibles. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. Here's the content. Jesus revealed that those who have fallen or those who are, excuse me, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Because the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will arise 
first. Hearing that the believers who had died would actually rise first was exactly what the Thessalonian church needed to hear. That was exactly what they needed to hear from their apostle. Why? Paul gives us some clues earlier in the book. Flip back to chapter 1 because our passage isn't the first or even the second time that Paul has mentioned the coming of the Lord. Let's start in verse 6, and we'll find out why this is Paul's first point of counsel for them. Chapter 1, verse 6 says, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for the, his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers from the wrath to come. Who delivers us from the wrath to come. The Thessalonian church was born out of persecution. You can go back and read the account for yourself in Acts 17. The first nine to, or ten verses detail Paul's time in Thessalonica. When Paul, Silas, and Timothy had gone there, on the second missionary journey, they were only there for three Sabbaths, so maybe not even a full three weeks. They were preaching and reasoning as they usually did with the Jews in the synagogue in Thessalonica. And while they preached for three Sabbaths, by God's grace, a church was birthed. There was a small number of Jews who believed and a great number of Gentiles who had already been worshiping according to Old Testament law, who believed in Jesus as the Messiah who was spoken about and prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. And from that group of people who believed, a few Jews and plenty Gentiles who were trusting in the Old Testament scriptures, the faith and the faithfulness of the Thessalonian church was so notable that believers in other places were taking note of this fledgling church and learning from them as well as commending their exemplary faith to others until the report finally reached back all the way to Paul. And what Paul heard about this church that he founded probably only a few months prior because he was run out of town by persecutors, what he heard was that they had turned to God from idols, according to verse 9, to do what? Verse 9 says that they had turned to God from idols to serve the living God, the living and true God. And verse 10 says that they had turned to God from idols to wait for his son from heaven. Here's the point. The Thessalonian church was faithfully doing what Paul had taught them to do when he founded the church, namely, serve God and to wait for Jesus from heaven. The event being described in our passage, 4, 13 to 18, was not new to the Thessalonian church. They already knew that Jesus was coming for them. That's why all together they had been waiting for Jesus to come from heaven to save them. And look, at, look again at verse uh, 10, chapter 1. They were waiting for Jesus, the same son that God the Father raised from the dead, from heaven, but to do what? Do you see it at the end of verse 10? What were they waiting for Jesus to descend from heaven to do? This says, who delivers us, or in some translations, rescues us, from the wrath to come. Can you believe that? 
Paul had taught the Thessalonians to serve God and to wait for Jesus from heaven, telling them that Jesus would come to rescue them from coming wrath. Coming wrath. For the longest time, maybe you can identify with me, I read this passage and quoted this verse as a verse about the gospel. That Jesus came from heaven to save people from the wrath of God. Is that true? Certainly it is. But that's not what the verse says, is it? This verse says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The verse says that the new, newborn church, was, which was established after Jesus, had already died under the wrath of God against sin, and then rose again and ascended and went back to heaven. This is after that, that this fledgling church was taught to wait for Jesus to save them from coming future wrath. The wrath spoken about here is not the wrath that Jesus absorbed on the cross is the point. Jesus wouldn't, doesn't have to descend from heaven to save us from wrath that he already endured on the cross. Paul went to Thessalonica and proclaimed a wrath that was yet future, coming against the unrepentant. And he taught them that the way to be saved from this wrath was to believe the gospel. And one day, Jesus would descend from heaven to rescue them from the wrath that was still yet to come. The wrath that Jesus rescued believers from on the cross is not called coming. That came, and it was absorbed. It was endured, for, it was endured by Christ. So, so how does this relate to our passage? Well, put yourself in the Thessalonian church's position for a second. Paul came to our city. He preached the gospel and told us that Jesus the Messiah died and rose again. We believed that message. And when we believe, he taught us to serve God, and he also taught us that there was this coming wrath, but that Jesus would come and rescue us from it. So we should be waiting for him to do just that. Because of Paul's teaching, they were waiting for Jesus to come and rescue them from coming wrath. But wait, Jesus hasn't rescued us. He hasn't come and rescued us from wrath. And now, since Paul got run out of town, it's month, months later, and in that period of time, some of us, we were all waiting together, some of us who were waiting together have now died. But Jesus hasn't come from heaven and saved us from wrath yet. So what happens to them? Did they, did they hope in vain? They were waiting together with us to be rescued from wrath, and now they're gone. They're not waiting together anymore with us. What happens? That's why Paul is writing the passage that, that we're looking at in chapter 4. Because they didn't know, they didn't have the answer to that question, it was causing them much grief. They didn't have the hope detailed for them yet. And so they were grieving as those who had no hope. The whole church had been waiting together for Jesus. Now the whole church was grieving together like they had missed the hope of being rescued together from God's coming wrath. Just like Frederick Douglass hadn't planned to gain his freedom alone, he wasn't waiting all that time to see freedom all by himself. He was waiting and planning to see freedom with his friends he was anticipating that when that event of finally having deliverance from slavery occurred, that he would experience it together with his cherished friends. And so when they were separated, he lost all hope. In a similar way, it was their separation from their church family by death that caused hopeless grief among the Thessalonian church. The Thessalonian church had been persecuted together. They had been taught by the Apostle Paul together. 
They had practiced exemplary faithfulness to the Lord together. They had learned to serve God together. They were continually waiting for Jesus together. And then some of their members died, and they began to grieve, totally unaware that their deceased brothers wouldn't miss the Lord's coming. Apparently, it's a big discussion among scholars uh, why Paul hadn't told the Thessalonians about what happened to believers who had died uh, when the Lord finally did come to take the church. Uh, There's a lot of speculation about, well, why didn't he tell them? Why is this missing information? And, And they give all kinds of reasons as to why that might be the case. Without going into those, though, the simplest explanation for why Paul didn't tell the Thessalonian church what happens to believers who had died at the coming of the Lord is simply because there were no believers who had died in Thessalonica. There were no believers in Thessalonica who had died waiting on Jesus. Why? Because Paul was the first one to go and tell them Jesus was the Messiah. He was the first one to arrive in Thessalonica and say, Jews, if you believe the Old Testament scriptures and proselyte Gentiles, if you believe our Old Testament scriptures, let me tell you about the Messiah who actually came. Of course they weren't waiting on Jesus. They didn't know he existed or that he was the Messiah or they hadn't believed yet. So Paul gets there and he doesn't have to tell them because he's a wise shepherd who's putting in front of them what they need most at the time for three Sabbaths, and he doesn't get to any dead believers. Nobody had died. But since the months that have passed, some believers have died, and now they need more information as to what happens to their friends. If Paul was teaching them to wait for Jesus to come, and they were all alive, then he didn't need to address the other group of deceased believers yet, because there were none. That was the case with the Thessalonians. They didn't know of any deceased, asleep believers among their their church from their midst. We can't say the same thing, can we? Grace Bible Church is well aware of believers who have passed from our body. Four weeks ago marked the one-year anniversary of John Kempiak's death. On Wednesday, it'll be a year since my dad died. And next month, on August 15th, it'll be the one-year anniversary of Teresa Caruso's death as well. It was a rough year for us. These three beloved saints are with the Lord now and numbered among those believers who were called in this passage as being asleep. And this is a comforting passage for Grace Bible. We too, this morning, need to be informed and or reminded of the resurrection priority. Look back at chapter 4, verse 15. This verse says that when the Lord comes to rescue his church from the coming wrath, those of us who are still alive will not be rescued before those who have fallen asleep. Grace Bible Church, if Jesus comes today, guess who gets to see Jesus first? John and Matt and Teresa. They get resurrected before we make it. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself, not sending a messenger, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. The resurrection, the priority is on those who will be resurrected. And this is not a secret. I don't know what a secret rapture is. Look at the details. Jesus descends from heaven 
with a cry of command. It's going to be heard. The voice of an archangel, the sound of the trumpet of God. That doesn't sound secret to me. Everybody's going to be aware of what's happening when Jesus comes to get his folks. And the dead in Christ will rise first. When Jesus comes, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power will speak one time, and that is all that's necessary to call all the believers who have been waiting for Jesus since he accomplished the gospel back to life, including John and Matt and Teresa and all the martyrs who were burned to ashes. Jesus, the omniscient God, knows where to get them from, how to call and recollect the bodies that have been burned, and they will be reassembled before the eyes of a watching world. And those believers will rise out of their graves, and they will go first to meet Jesus in the air. We don't need to grieve for them like people who don't have hope, like they've missed the hope of the resurrection or the coming of Jesus. They haven't missed it. They actually are first in line. They have their hope fulfilled before we do. So we don't need to grieve. The Thessalonian church didn't need to grieve. One day they will finally have their Savior, body and soul and all, put back together in an instant and will be with Jesus first before us. That will be a glorious day. But that's still not the end. Paul isn't done putting an end to the hopeless grief of the Thessalonian church yet. He continues on in verse 17 by number two, relaying the coming reunion. The Thessalonians needed to know more than that their friends would be resurrected. They also needed to know, secondly, the, re the relaying of the coming reunion. Look at verse 17. After the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, that is at the coming, will be caught up together with them, the resurrected saints, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. After Jesus resurrects all the saints who have died while waiting for the Lord to come, then those of us who are alive who are left will join those saints to meet Jesus in the air. Can you imagine? We miss our friends, and then to see them resurrected in the air with Jesus, and then Jesus calls us up too, that's going to be a glorious family reunion. All of us together in the air with Jesus. The next time we see John and Matt and Teresa in our resurrected bodies, as we, as we really want to see them, it won't actually be in heaven. The next time that we will see them will be again on earth or above the earth, hovering somewhere above the earth in the air. And so then we will all have our hope fulfilled because it says at the end of verse 17, and we will always be with the Lord. That is ultimately the Christian hope. The desire is to be with the Lord in the flesh. Even Job was looking forward to that, in the flesh to see God. And we will finally have our God, and we will be with him forever. After all of this was communicated by Paul to the church, after he gave them the details that they were lacking, well, there's really only one thing left for Paul to do. And so that's what we see in verse 18. Number three, 
the final thing that Paul did to put an end to the hopeless grieving of the Thessalonian church was by requiring their mutual participation. Requiring their mutual participation. Paul is such a wise shepherd. And here, through Paul, God entrusts the ongoing soul care of the church to the church. Verse 18 says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Y'all, all all y'all, encourage one another with these words. This is a command from God that the Thessalonians were obligated to obey. And by implication, Grace Bible Church must also obey this command to encourage one another, not just about anything or random things or the things you like to be encouraging about, but encourage one another, one another specifically about Jesus coming from heaven to first rescue those who are asleep and then to rescue those of us who are alive, who are left, all of us from the coming wrath of God. These words are enough to cure any Christian of hopeless grief. So let me ask you, when was the last time you obeyed this command? Are you eager to obey this command now? I hope so. That's the intended effect of this passage. This type of encouragement, if it's been absent from much of your walk or all of the loving interaction that Grace Bible Church is so known for, for exercising toward one another, if this has been lacking, then add this to your tool belt. Add this encouragement to your repertoire of ways to encourage other believers. Let me point out a few other implications from this text. Notice that Paul is giving very specific very exact, very particular details about this future coming of the Lord. This, is, this falls within the realm of, of what theologians call eschatology, study of the end times, what's to come. The description includes incredible precision in its details. Like the reason Jesus comes from heaven what follows his coming, wrath, why he's writing about this eschatological event, who gets resurrected by Jesus' coming, and even in what order. There is absolutely nothing that would lead us to believe that what we think about end times events from this passage is unimportant. This is so different, what the, the tone that Paul is writing for. He wants them to be encouraged. He says, encourage one another with these words. And then if you jump down to verse 11 in chapter 5, after giving more details about what comes next, he says it again. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This mattered to Paul, that they have the details of their eschatology straight. There's nothing about the tone of this that would say, ah, I'll know it when it happens. I don't need to worry about that right now. I got the gospel right. We don't need to split hairs on eschatology. Paul thought so, and so he told him what was going to happen. If it's it's unclear to you, like it, it has been for me for a long time, it's understandable But the lack of clarity is not with the text, right? The problem's with the receptor, with the interpreters. So we need to prayerfully go back to the text and seek to discover what Paul intends us to obey, intends us to be encouraged by. Another thing, perhaps the most shocking 
aspect of this text of preparing and studying this for me was was the resident ecclesiology uh, study of the church what it what it says about the church embedded in this passage is astounding it is phenomenal and this is without Paul teaching specifically about the nature of the church or what the church is or should be doing necessarily but undergirding all of these instructions, there had to be things that were true about the Thessalonian church or else the instruction wouldn't have worked. Let me explain a few of these things. First off, they were actually intentionally waiting on Jesus, right? That's clear. If they weren't waiting for Jesus corporately as a church, not like one guy waiting for Jesus while other people do their own thing. If they weren't corporately waiting together, this passage falls apart. Secondly, they were actually grieved. They were actually grieved when when some of them died while waiting for Jesus. How do you know the Thessalonians weren't merely uh, Sunday churchgoers? because they knew each other well enough to recognize when someone was actually missing from among them. And not only did they notice someone was missing, but they were close enough in relationship to one another that when someone did die, that believer was actually missed. If you died today, oh glorious day, right? If you died today, would Grace Bible Church feel the loss? You students in student ministries, if you died today, are you so well connected to the other members of this body that you would, your presence would be missed? That somebody would say, I miss Sam's encouragement. How Sam used to tell me about Jesus coming. Or Elissa. She talked about Jesus coming. It was so encouraging the way she used to communicate that, and she's gone now. I miss her. Or Josh, he used to talk about Jesus this way. We're really going to miss that. That ought to be the case among us. Are you so busy serving together, serving together with In Grace Bible Church, enduring persecution together with Grace Bible Church, exemplifying faithful living together with Grace Bible Church, together spurring one another on to excel in holy living, that should the Lord take you today, your absence would cause the body to realize that our togetherness is different now because this person is no longer together with us. May it be among us that this is the case. Detailed throughout Thessalonians, you get glimpses as Paul commends the Thessalonian church on what they're doing well, what they were actually doing right, the type of church it it must have been. That's all throughout the letter. We don't have time to, to look back at those. I'd encourage you to read it this week all in one sitting to get a good idea of, of what the Thessalonian church was like. What else should we be thinking as we consider Jesus coming? Answering that question is really a matter of just simply seeing where else God leads Paul in the letter. How should the the coming of our Lord impact us? Everything that comes after what we're reading now in chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4 and leading up to the beginning of chapter 5, really flows out of the theology that Jesus is coming back, guys. Jesus is coming back. And here's what else Paul tells the Thessalonians to do in light of that reality. And this also applies to Grace Bible Church. Listen at this list. Be sober. Be sober. 
Jesus is coming back. Put on the breastplate of faith and love. Also put on the hope of salvation for a helmet. Why? Jesus is coming back. Encourage one another and build one another up, as we already saw. Respect and highly esteem and love your leaders who labor among you and admonish you in the Lord. Be at peace among yourselves. Admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Why? Jesus is coming back. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil. Always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Why? We should be thinking about Jesus' return. If we were, we would be a holy people. It would impact our lives. That is what this passage is intended to do. This is the way it's intended to instruct us. Grace Bible Church, the Lord is coming. We still find ourselves in the same position as the Thessalonian church. The Lord is coming. Why? The Lord is coming because God has not predestined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So then, wait on the Lord to come. And while you wait, let's eagerly serve God together. Let's pray. God, you are so good to to give us your word. Even the care that you have, the love that you have for the church, even for this church, is born out in this passage. That you give us a wealth of information, of, of instruction, so that we would be encouraged and encourage one another. Even as we consider your return for your people, God, I think about our our children, all the children in this church who need to be ready for your coming, God. They need to flee to you the refuge from the wrath to come that is against unbelievers. Our children need that, God. Would you save them? Make them trust in Jesus, not because mom and dad love Jesus, but give them a true sense of their own need for a Savior. Help us be faithful in our parenting. And God, make us more zealous to talk about these things and more eager to to serve the Lord as we wait for our Savior who delivers us from the wrath to come. God, as we sing this song now, I pray that this, we sing of this old glorious day, that it w- the, the words would take on new significance uh, for us after considering these things. Amen.